Hi, Raffaello. Thank Hi. you so much for being uh, here uh, with us at uh, UZ. Thanks for having us. Yeah, that's great. And so tell us about the... So you have a conference this afternoon and you're going to do some, uh, some crazy things with drones. We've heard about that. Can you tell us a little bit? Just give a little teaser. Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, the you know, art, science and engineering behind flying machines. And part of the talk will be a little demonstration that we'll do halfway through, through the talk. Where we're going to fly a swarm of uh, roughly 30 drones. 30 drones? Okay, 30 drones. Uh, Raffaello, you came uh, four years ago uh, at UZ. What are the big evolution in the drone industry since uh, the last time? I mean, I think a lot has happened in four years. Uh, you see a lot more uh, widespread deployment of drones. I think you're starting to see a lot more uh, commercial use as opposed to consumer use of drones. People are starting to use drones more and more in industrial applications, um, not just hobbyists. Uh, but you know, it's a rapidly evolving field, uh, and people are really starting to see the you know the power uh, in being able to to move things around almost anywhere you want at any time. Can you give us example in um, the industry area? One of the big use cases of, uh, of drones in commercial applications is, uh, is an inspection. So being able to go to places that are hard to reach, that are dangerous, uh, power lines, uh, um, uh, power generators, um, uh, oil refineries, hard to reach places, you can very easily do it with drones. There's a startup that uh, was spun out from our lab uh, at ETH uh, called Perspective Robotics, Photokite, where they're using drones to help firefighters um, uh, being able to do reconnaissance uh, during, you know, when there's an event, um, uh, uh, a fire, so to be able to get different views of, uh, of, of what's happening. So it, it, you can just imagine if you can put a sensor anywhere in space, anywhere in time, there's a lot of information that can be obtained in that way. Drones are a lot in all the science fiction movies, and uh, so we've seen a lot of videos, you know, with drones everywhere in the in the cities of the future. Do you think that's really that's something that is possible and that's going to happen, or because it seems at the same time it seems like really complicated, well, the, the legislation and uh, you know to make it really happen? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of hurdles. Um, uh, the regulatory ones are certainly some of them that have to be uh, figured out. Um, you know, if you're going to fly drones over people's heads, they have to be super safe and reliable, and right now they're not. They're not at the level that they need to be in order to have ubiquitous coverage of, but it takes time. I mean, think about uh, uh, the airline industry. You know, it started roughly 100 years ago, and uh, you know, the mean time between failure was super, super high. It was dangerous to fly. In 2017, I, I think there was a statistic that the number of deaths caused by uh, in, in, in uh, accidents, airline accidents for commercial applications, not private, but you know, was zero. So we had none in 2017, but it took 100 years to get there. It's gonna take a long time. Uh, regulatory, there's the business aspect of it. You know, do you really need a drone to deliver a pizza, right? So you know, I think it makes sense for, for things that have a high value to weight ratio. Um, and, yeah, for uh, medical stuff or uh, for medical stuff, uh, and of course, there's a t and it will eventually propagate down as the technology becomes mature, as the drones become much more reliable. But at first, I think you're going to see it for very high value to weight ratio, and that will continue on. Um, so you you have worked with the Cirque du Soleil, right? With your drones, can you tell us about that? We did um, uh, uh, the company that uh, was spun out of my lab, uh, Verity Studios. Uh, 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 work with Cirque to create um, uh, a, a scene in, in the show Paramore where eight lampshades, which are really drones dressed as lampshades, come to life and engage in a, in a choreography with, a, with the two performers on stage. And they did this for 398 shows in front of uh, 2,000 people um, uh, flying over the performers day in and day out. There are more and more um, artistic show with drones. Um, can you tell us a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah, so Verity has done a lot of uh, high-profile shows. Uh, they were on tour with uh, Metallica, the rock band Metallica. 
they're on tour with Drake. Uh, they um, were part of the um, uh, 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 the um, at Madison Square Garden, the pregame show for the basketball team, the Knicks. Um, they're on cruise ships across the world, uh, Changi Airport, their Christmas special. Um, they were part of CCTV's New Year's Gala in China. It's the largest televised event. Over a billion people viewed it. So, um, operated in uh, 100 different venues, 20 countries. And, uh, uh, do you think it's a way to evangelize about drone, or do you think um, that uh, give us a new potential for artistic show? I think it's both. I think they can be used in artistic ways, as we have shown. Um, a lot of folks are talking. We Verity only does indoor uh, drones, uh, but folks that are doing outdoor drones, well, people are viewing them as a way to replace fireworks, right? A con economically friendly way of doing fireworks, uh, less expensive. Uh, so I think people are starting to see the artistic use of this technology. When we when we um, when Verity flies the drones, they're not. It's not just a drone show. It's integrated as part of the overall performance. And how does it work? Do you operate them live or uh, are they just programmed and then you can like send them, any, I don't know, like everywhere on, on a show with Metallica and they're programmed and they do like always the same thing? Or is there like a live operator that controls them? And It's a, it's a bit of both. Um, we, for example, let's take a show like Metallica. Um, we would, uh, Verity would um, commission the system We would work with their creatives to create the choreographies. Maybe we make multiple choreographies. Um, and then uh, we don't operate it personally. We, uh, again, commission it. We train their, their uh, operators and they take it on tour. And they're the ones that set the system up, calibrate it, make sure that it's ready to work. And, and when show time, time comes, they, they operate it, take it down, move it to the next city. If they want a new choreography, they work with us. We create a new choreography, but we really try to hand it out over to to the to the client. It's really the only way that we can scale. You, you don't want to be on the tour with Metallica, that's why. Well, actually, so we had, to, in fact, uh, you know, we're, we're going to do a little show today. Um, it's a very small one, but uh, Claire, the person that's uh, uh, managing the, this project, she actually was on tour with Metallica for about three of the cities as they were getting the bugs out and figuring out how to use it. So she did, uh, she did spend some time with them and with Drake too. How do you feel about the evolution of robotics? More general, not only drones, but robotics. How do you feel about that? Because, um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on. And, um... Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a rapidly moving field. I think one of the things that people don't appreciate is in order for a system that includes ro robots to be um, economically viable, it has to be super, super reliable. Because once we start using this technology and we our processes uh, are geared towards this technology, when it doesn't work, there's huge costs associated with it. Think of electricity, right? We take it for granted. And if, if electricity was not around for an event like this, the event wouldn't happen, yeah, right? Yeah, wouldn't be no so, event, yeah. Uh, and I think this is what, this is, a, a lot of times reliability and uh, robustness are something that comes at the end. And I think that is what's holding back a lot of robotics technology is people see videos on YouTube and they think, well, this is already here. Well, the fact it's one thing to make a video It's one thing to make a lab demo, and yet, yet another one to deploy it and have it work 24-7. And there's a lot of stuff that has to happen to do that. And do you think the opinion of the, the, the people, of the general uh, audience, has changed towards, uh, towards uh, robotics? I mean, do, do you think that they are more into robots and they can more imagine themselves living around uh, robots or um, any device uh, that's uh, yeah. like something like a robot? or? Do they have overcome the Terminator uh, vision I think of the that, robotic? I think that uh, that has happened already. I mean, case in point, when uh, when I started doing, uh, uh, I've been doing research with fly machines for a long time. I, I, I really restarted it again uh, in earnest in 2008, and we started the flying machine arena. I never used the word drone. I would not use the word drone because it had hugely negative connotations when I started do, you know, to, to re really engage with research, build my research group around it. Um, now I use the word drone because the average individual, when they think of the word drone, they don't no longer think of the military 
applications, they think of the consumer versions that you can buy at the store. They have all seen the videos from Amazon and... Uh... Correct, correct. So, so I think, uh, you know, people get accustomed to, to new technology. What do you think it was the uh, thing about the consumer drone? Uh, you know, all this project in Kickstarter when you uh, launch the drone in your pocket and it follow you uh, while you are skiing or stuff like that. And uh, I don't think those projects are really live. Almost every single Kickstarter involving drones, uh, Kickstarter and equivalent, it's not, Kickstarter is not the only platform, failed um, simply because most of the most of the effort went into creating fancy marketing videos as opposed to really solving the hard technological problems of robustness and reliability uh, so yes people's imaginations run wild but it's hardware uh, integrated with software is really difficult to pull off but actually selfie drones they do exist right they exist now that's right but and it they, took some time uh, and how do you feel about this uh, so I don't have one. Uh -huh. um, uh, I'd rather have some, give somebody my camera and say, can you take a picture of me? Uh, so again, it's the people are trying to figure out the economics of this. And by the way, consumer, anything that's consumer is hard. Because consumer, um, the consumer is fickle and it's like fashion. It's very difficult to predict what's going to be successful and what's not. I mean, uh, you guys are young. You probably don't remember the, you know, the Palm Pilot. The Palm Pilot? The Palm Pilot. Oh, uh, yeah, the, the Palm with the personal with the organizer, pen. right? With the pen, yeah. You know, it was, it was a bit of a disaster, right? It was, a, yeah. uh, it was timing, and of course, you know, uh, fast forward to today, we have our smartphones. They're a huge, huge success. Sometimes things are a little bit too early. Uh, so it's, uh, the consumer market is difficult. I give credit for people to try and stuff and see what works and what doesn't. And actually, I think they are doing kind of uh, evangelization on the drones, so... Thanks to their imagination, we are willing to have something new. Really yeah, that's correct. I mean, I think um, I personally think that doing consumer stuff is too risky as an entrepreneur. I'd rather, you know, work with uh, do B two B sort of work. It's just uh, it's just a less riskier business, and a lot of times the the uh, it, it's a you know you can follow a certain roadmap um, and quantify what the risk is. But I think it's great that people are trying to do it. I think it's awesome. Uh, sorry, yesterday you had um, an interesting talk with uh, Fleur Pellerin and um, uh, another speaker, I don't remember his name, about a lot of stuff and about uh, the future and the future of work, actually. And you talked about basic income, so I just wanted to ask you about that because uh, you said uh, interesting stuff, I think, about how uh, people define themselves through work and uh, that you think that basic income couldn't work. That's what you said or not exactly? What I'm, what I'm basically saying is that it's a very complicated issue and I can see both sides of it. T people tend to be polarized. I actually see the, the arguments that people are making and they, both sides make very strong arguments. One argument for a basic income is, 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 is obvious. We can use automation, robotics, this technology to remove grunt work, right? We can free people from doing things that are repetitive and not really mentally challenging. So that's, Why not, that's a good thing. That's a great yeah. thing. Yeah. Why not free these people up to do anything but that, including just reading books or bettering themselves? I mean, it only makes sense from a big picture level that we should be doing that. But it's not that simple because, you know, human beings are complex, complex uh, animals and we derive a lot of our self-worth from the jobs that we do. So just putting everybody on you know, welfare or a large portion of people on welfare, are we really doing people a favor? I think it's, I think it's a complicated issue. So to come back on the, um, on the company side, uh, what type of um, work do they ask you to do with your flying machine uh, despite the um, inspection? Yeah, so one of the things that we're looking at, uh, all in the context of indoors, is things like data collection, um, uh, being able to fly around in a large warehouse and making sure that things are where they're supposed to be. Uh, figuring out what inventory is there, reading barcodes, cross-checking that with, uh, with a database to make sure that it's there. There's issues of security, being able, you know, you, you hear uh, you, uh, there's an alarm, you want to make sure that uh, that area is secure. You know, with a drone, with a camera, you can get a whole bunch of different views and angles. Uh, that also relates to uh, monitoring, 
uh, being able to um, look at look at a pipe, make sure that there's no leaks, make sure that there's uh, the humidity is within a, uh, an acceptable level. I mean, these warehouses are huge. They're getting higher and higher. Putting people there is takes a lot of time and it puts them at risk. And it only makes sense to use small, um, easily to deploy drones, fully automated, to be able to put a sensor anywhere in space, anywhere in time. Okay. Uh, I was looking at your t-shirt, uh, I really like it, um, and I was wondering what do you think about the um, uh, personal transportation with, uh, with kind of drone, you know, uh, in big cities such as uh, San Paolo or yeah. New York? And well, the reality of it is we already have flying taxis, they're called helicopters, right? <laughs> um, so um, it's just an issue, I, I don't think it's a radical change. We have helicopters. What's the problem with helicopters? They are super expensive to maintain and operate. Um, it's less about the cost of the pilot. It's less about the autonomy. It's more the machine itself. So I think what you're going to see happen is lower. And th there's, a, there's, a, there's a great saying, which is a helicopter is a thousand moving parts all conspiring to kill you. Helicopters are complex devices. Um, the new generation of Uh, small flying machines are much simpler, which means that, uh, mechanically simpler, which means that they're going to be more robust and more reliable, easier to maintain, much lower cost. I think what you're going to see, the next generation will still be pilots, right, um, flying these machines as regular taxis, but it'll just cost a lot less than having your own private helicopter or leasing a helicopter to take you from point A to point B. I think the autonomy part where we replace the pilot with a fully autonomous system, I think that's a much longer ways away because the economics are going to take a long time for us to get there. And talking about flying, uh, what about the, the jetpacks? How do you feel about that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you think that is something uh, that is going to be everywhere? Or So one of the things about <laughs> jetpacks is they're What's super loud. Oh yeah. Right? They're super loud and uh, I think it's more of an entertainment. Um, Uh, and it's com maybe complicated also It's complicated. To, uh, they're not that robust operate. and reliable. Um, I think uh, there are folks that are, that are uh, exploring um, entertainment uh, versions of this in a controlled environment where you get this feeling of flight and, you know, it's, it's like a joyride of some sorts. Um, but you never know what uh, is down the future. What, I mean, you can look at some basic physics. Um, and if you do something like that, it's, it's very inefficient. Uh, so, as a means of personal transport, you're always going to be competing against, uh, you know, ground robots, which are much, uh, or autonomous vehicles on the ground, which are much more efficient. Uh, so, I, I think that's the trade-off. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.